Hello everyone, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're giving a new game a look. We're giving a game called The Arms Race, uh, the Cold War or Arms Race, the Cold War Era a shot. Uh, it's created by a company or a small group called Elana or El Elena Digital. Uh, there's three people on this project, at least according to the credits. Uh, you've got Max Spearn, the producer, you've got Dmitry Vavilov, the Unity developer, and you've got Sergei Sizi, who developed the map and the, the 3D animations. This is actually a sequel to a game that came out last year that was just called The Cold War Era. Um, but really, it's, it appears to be the same game, at least based on the screenshots, with just a much more enhanced feel and look to it. Uh, so the game that came out last year was much more bare bones. The game that you see here in front of you still is has an old-timey feel to it. Don't worry, it's not in this window forever. This is just sort of the intro uh, menu. Um, but it, it still has a little bit of a kind of an indie, small developer feel. It almost feels a little bit like uh, Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space in terms of the way the UI is laid out, some of the color palettes, things like that. Uh, this video is very much going to be a first look video at this game. Uh, I was intrigued by it. I got a message from the developer asking if it was something I, you know, was interested in. I asked for a key. I'd actually seen it, I want to say it was in early access, um, a couple months back, and I saw it, and it kind of was intrigued, but I've been obviously working through my Ultimate General Civil War series, uh, so I haven't had a lot of a time for other things. But I know on my uh, stream the other night, uh, several people said, hey, why don't you give this game a look when I mentioned it? Um, so this game puts you in the shoes of either the United States or the Soviet Union. During the Cold War, the game starts in 1950 and basically runs until uh, your opponent collapses or, or various achievements are met. Um, there's different achievements for different difficulty levels. The easy achievement is to win the space race, um, and the uh, medium and hard difficulties have different accomplishments. The interesting thing is you can't change your difficulty up to hard or medium until you've won at the easy level. Um, when you choose the US, you just click on the US flag up here. When you choose the Soviet Union, you just click their flag. And then you can choose your leader. So you could be Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev, or Gorbachev. Each leader has a different trait to them. So Stalin, for example, gives you increased air, ground, and naval firepower, which is important in terms of winning battles. Uh, he also reduces military technology cost and gives you an additional military production every year. Khrushchev is more focused on the space race, so he reduces space technology costs, he reduces diplomatic production costs, he allows you to uh, produce more spies more efficiently. Brezhnev is a diplomatic influence guy, so he's really sort of the diplomat of the group. Um, gives you more spies and diplomats every year. And Gorbachev is someone who gives you something that's called global consequences, which are various random events that can occur throughout the game um, and influence either the Soviet Union or the United States, uh, as well as a diplomatic spiel to them. So that's the standard Soviet template, and the American template are all based off the Soviets. So Truman uh, has the exact same traits as Stalin, uh, Kennedy is the same as, Gore, or as uh, Khrushchev, Nixon is Brezhnev, and Reagan is Gorbachev in terms of their traits. Obviously, you've got a little different image here, but the interesting thing is the suit's the same. So you've got Stalin in his sort of old communist suit here. You click on the U.S. flag, and you've got Truman in that same suit. You move over to Kennedy, and he's got a suit which seems appropriate for Kennedy, but it's actually the same suit that Khrushchev is in, so it's kind of a weird little graphical thing there. Um, you do have the ability to change your leader's traits, so those traits were all based on the historical traits for those characters, but you can actually click through here and you could make uh, Khrushchev an economic focus or a military focus or a diplomatic focus. He still gets that space technology cost bonus, just like Stalin always gets that firepower bonus. So basically there's one unique trait to your leader, that's here on the left. And on the right, that can be customized by changing this little trait here from historic to whatever you want it to be. We're going to play as the Soviet Union, and we're going to play as Khrushchev uh, to... Really, I, I think the space race is kind of the direction I want to see if I can try and go. Um, so we'll go with that. We'll go with a space technology uh, Khrushchev. But I think we'll also go with military technology as well. So we'll have a militaristic Khrushchev. He won't be the historic, diplomatic, and spy-focused. He'll be the militaristic Khrushchev. 
Um, we could play as the U.S. as well, as I've already pointed out, but we're just going to play as the Soviet Union, and we're going to play as Khrushchev, and we're going to play with a militaristic Khrushchev. So we'll go ahead and hit launch, and we'll jump in here. One thing I will call out, um, you can't play Iron Mo Man mode until you get to medium difficulty. The tutorial here is just a YouTube video, so there's a little bit it's lacking there. It's definitely um, not a robust tutorial. It's just a video that shows you some basic features. And uh, the manual is a 13-page PDF, which is definitely easily digestible, but I wouldn't say I feel terribly prepared going in. I know some basics. I read through the manual, but I'm not sure I am terribly comfortable with where we're going. So this is very much a first look of the game. I have read the manual, but that's about it. So let's go ahead and jump in. All right, do I have an ability to pause here? All right, we're gonna pause. So here's the main game map. Uh, if we look, we'll see the Soviet Union, obviously is the country that we selected and we're going to be playing as. Um, and then if we go over here, the United States is obviously out here. Interestingly enough, uh, because we tro chose Khrushchev and made him a militaristic character, well, actually, no, that's random, because Nixon is the equivalent to Brezhnev. So it appears that the United States leader is selected randomly. I know when I picked uh, Stalin, I, I did a really quick playthrough. I really didn't click through anything, but I did a really quick playthrough just to kind of see what the map looked like, and I picked Stalin. I did see Truman, and I did the historic Stalin, I got the historic Truman. So I don't know, you know, if this is... Uh, this is some level of randomness in terms of the opponent you face. The enemy leader will change every 10... Uh, I believe it's every... 5 to 10 years or 10 to 15 years so Nixon will not be your opponent forever the game claims that uh, the strategy of the United States will change based on their leader and his traits I don't know how true that is but obviously that's something that um, is an interesting and intriguing concept if, if, if real um, you can see here we've got the Soviet Union which is colored in red we've got other Soviet uh, satellites if you will in Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria Czechoslovakia and East Germany all also so highlighted in red that basically means that they're in the soviet sphere of influence uh we have uh, more influence over them uh than the enemy does uh we've got you know it looks like just trying to see they all look like they're kind of 50 or 40 so this little red icon sorry about that um, so this kind of main screen gives you information about uh, the actual country you've selected. So, for example, you click on the Soviet Union, uh, and it gives you information about the Soviet Union. Uh, the numbers here influence all sorts of different factors in the game. So on the left here, this little smiley face represents the support within the country for your government. The red fist, or not the red, but the fist represents opposition. So, for example, in the Soviet Union, the government is 90% support, 10% opposition. In Eastern Germany, it's 30% support, 70% opposition. Uh, and in West Germany, it's 90% support and 10% opposition. Um, you also have an amount of money that's available to you. This $2,500 represents your budget, more or less. So if we go up here, you'll see the U.S. and the Soviet Union actually start with the same budget. Uh, both start with $2,500. And individual small countries don't seem to have their own budgets. It's, it all seems to tie back to the alliance block that they're in or, or, or something to that effect because I'm not sure why Yugoslavia would have the same budget as the Soviet Union. Um, additionally here, these other icons, this little spy icon represents the number of spies you have available for assigning various operations. We'll get into that a little bit later. The AK-47 symbol represents the number of military units or military capability you have, and the briefcase represents the number of diplomats that you have. Um, wondering if it makes sense to do any more explanation of this until we just kind of jump in. I'm thinking we'll probably just jump in. Uh, real quick along the top here, this number 22 on both sides is the score. So. 
Um, right now, the U.S. has a score of 22, and we have a score of 22. Your score is represented by the influence that you have over other countries, the countries that are within your sphere of influence. So, for example, the Soviet Union obviously is our own country within our own sphere of influence and gives us a score of 5. Romania gives us a score of 1. Bulgaria gives us a score of 1. You can see down here on this left. Czechoslovakia actually gives us a score of 3, interestingly enough. Uh, Poland 3, East Germany 3. So these red countries, their score adds up to give us our 22. The goal is to shift more and more of these countries to the red, to the Soviet side, which will increase our score. Um, this number 3 represents the number of political points you have. You have to use political points to increase your budget in certain categories. So if I want to increase military spending, space race spending, each, one, each time I want to increase that budget, it takes one political point, and you only get three every year. Both sides gets three every year. These buttons up here represent different menus. So the little rocket here represents the space race. We click on it, and we get the summary page of the space race. We click on this little... Um, I don't know, graph bar or whatever, and we can see a breakdown of that score. So we've got a score of 22, and you can see here uh, where those points come from us and as well as the United States. You also see your influence rating and your opposition rating within those individual countries. Um, that kind of gives you a sense of if they're at risk for maybe toppling or falling to, to the enemy. Countries that are gray are considered neutral. They don't have a country that's kind of overlording them in terms of an influence perspective, and as a result, they don't assign score to anyone. Um, you can use spies and diplomats to try and change that. And this page also allows you to understand, like, what are you spending on diplomats? What are you spending on spies? So right now we're spending $1 per month on spies nothing on diplomats at the moment. If you go to the military screen, you'll see here there's a, a military screen that gives you information about developing naval units, ground units, and air units, which all influence a, a factor called firepower, which actually influences your ability to win military engagements, which we'll probably get into in a little bit of a different uh, period a little bit later. But uh, likewise, your budget for military is down here on the right, and you can only increase it based on the number of political points you have. You've then got your budget here, which you can see as the Soviet Union, we're spending $24 per month. Uh, revenues haven't been told to us yet. You also will have a random increase in your GNP for both countries, uh, and you've got a total GNP. These will form graphs as the game goes on. And then you have the um, sort of global events uh, that can occur. You've got things like the Vietnam War, the Berlin Airlift, the New Way in India. All these things will be decided by events that occur in the game. And each one of these has a different, uh, you know, each decade has a different group of these uh, global events. Some of them can be good for you. Some of them can be bad for you. For example, American communism makes the U.S. government weaker gives Soviet Union increased influence, uh, but, uh, you know, the Berlin airlift is really good for the United States. So that's that. Um, on the bottom here, you've got sort of your summary. So right now, the U.S. has 50% of the global influence, which can give you an increase in firepower. It's kind of represented in global influence or global prestige. Uh, both sides have the same influence, but as you accomplish different things, build new advanced military units, uh, succeed in the space race, uh, your influence can increase or decrease. So this is uniform across the globe. Think of it as your prestige. The more prestigious you are, the more people will kind of listen to you or heed your advice in terms of like global politics. And that's represented in terms of the Soviet Union's influence across the globe or the U.S.'s influence across the globe. If you have a lot of influence and people really kind of buy into you, then that can give you a firepower boost as well uh, as people intrinsically, you know, kind of uh, seed to you, it kind of gives you an advantage, uh, and uh, you can, that's another way you kind of win, if you will. Um, we can get a quick read on several different countries just by clicking on the flags on the map here. These are kind of some substantial countries where major events will occur throughout the world, um, just by clicking on the maps down here. Um, additionally, there will be various conflicts that can come up, so the Korean War is probably about to start and we'll see we can invest military resources there or not, depending on how we want to handle that. Um, but that's that's about where we're at. So, um, that's a lot of me rambling without chance of a breath. I'm going to uh, take a moment here just to get a uh, grab a real quick drink, and then we'll start the game in just a moment.
in case you're wondering what I'm drinking. Um, I'm wetting my mouth with a shot of vodka because we're playing as the Soviet Union, right? So we should, uh, we should probably have vodka. At least that's my assumption. All right, so before we get going, uh, I just want to call out the game is mostly real-time. There is a turn-based option, which I'm not quite sure what the turn represents. I haven't tried that out. Uh, there's also slow, medium, and fast in terms of real-time speeds the game moves, and obviously there's a pause option. I'm really going to focus a lot of effort on getting ahead in the space race. So you can see here uh, the first item that we're researching. There's two different categories that you research. You research ground facilities and you research launchers in the space race. And this map here represents all the different things that you have to research to win the space race at the end. Um, so for example, the initial research for the Belkinor Cosmodrome is the world's first and largest operational space launch facility. It costs $48 to do that, which doesn't sound like a lot, right? But remember, you have to assign one political point in order to spend any money. Right now we're spending nothing on uh, the space race. So if we were to assign $1, then you can see here our political points drop down to two. And remember, you only get political points once per year. This $1 represents $1 of spending every month, so it would take 48 months at this spending level to build that initial Cosmodrome, which seems a little bit low. I want to kind of get a, a kick start. I, I want to get an early edge to my space race. So we'll actually assign a second dollar as well, which will mean in two years we will accomplish this first goal. These different uh, milestones, though, you can see these all cost varying degrees of money. Uh, as you as you go through here and some of them get to be pretty expensive so you can see you could really sink your budget quickly if we go to the budget screen you'll see our expenditures are now $48 uh, per year I guess this is yearly expenditures because it's two dollars per month so that would be yeah forty eight dollars per year I suppose um, but you can see here two dollars that'll be 24 months we've got one more political point to spend and I think what we're going to do is we're going to spend it on military production. Or maybe we spend it on research and development. We've already got military production. We've got 30 military units available. I say we spend it on uh, military research. So again, right now, the military tree works the same way the space race tree does. By the way, this is just for ground facilities. I, I mentioned that. There's also things like rockets, which obviously you need a rocket to get into space. So the R1 rocket, sort of the initial Soviet V2 option. You have to invest money in launchers as well to get into space. We can't do that till we build our initial ground facility. So right now, we'll spend the two on ground facilities. We won't spend anything on launchers because we can't. And then as time progresses in the space race, we'll unlock all these different achievements and then we'll unlock the rocket achievements as well uh, moving us toward the moon if we go to the military screen here same concept applies so you can see here right now we have the mig 15 as our fighter aircraft the is2 as our tank and the uh, zulu uh, class ssk submarine diesel powered submarine class in order to advance along these tech trees, we also have to advance, or we also have to invest money. So we can research the T-55, for example, but that's actually the same cost as that initial ground facility. It's forty-eight dollars. Right now, we're spending one dollar per month on building military units, but we're not spending anything on research here. And uh, given we're going to be in the Korean War here very shortly, I do think it makes some sense to spend a little bit of money on um, on the military side of things. So we're gonna go ahead and spend our one remaining political point on land uh, expenditures. That's the little icon represents the land. It'll take us two years at this rate to advance our spending, but it is what it is. You can see here it goes up by a factor of 12. So expenditures are now $60 uh, per month uh, in terms of what we're spending on various programs. Um, Captain, we're showing Nixon as president because the enemy that you face changes every 10 to 15 years, and it randomly assigned Nixon when we picked Khrushchev. You can obviously see we have Khrushchev in 1950. It should be Stalin, but I got to pick my leader. Uh, as a result, the AI also has a, a historical leader. Okay, so if we go ahead and we unpause the game, we'll set the, the speed to medium. You'll see here that... Uh, time starts moving and look at that we've already got a war going in korea let's go ahead and pause it and see we can see here uh, in korea you've got sort of icons representing conflict occurring american troops are entering the country in south korea to support the local government and if we click on south korea well actually 
yeah, if we click on South Korea here, we'll see there are various military icons within the country. You can see these little dashes represent Western or American military units. These little red stars represent Soviet military units or communist military units, so the, the northern military uh military forces so right now we're outnumbered in south korea north korea we we heavily outnumber the enemy and that's where these military uh numbers come into play so you see, we saw we've got 30 ak 47s so what that means is we can assign military units to fight in south korea uh, to support the north korean regime but it just costs us five military units to bring our forces up to parity with the allied forces additionally we have 10 spies so we could increase our spy network to counter the enemy as well spies allow us to do things like support riots so the the uh, south koreans had a parade supporting their government which increases this little smiley face figure here which represents support for the south korean government if we go ahead and support a riot you'll see here that the opposition score rises the support score drops and you get a little update here that anti-government protests are erupting all throughout south korea that could allow us theoretically over time to topple the south korean government and change it to a pro-northern stance um so in north korea for example we can go ahead and support a parade in order to increase our support so the north korean regime also does not have very good support the amount that you increase this uh, by having those events like a, a parade or a riot is based on the number of spies you have in a country so we have two spies in north korea that increased our support by two if we had five we could increase it by five um, but you only have so many spies to assign we've got seven left to assign here for example um, and we've got um, you know a a strong amount of influence over uh, North Korea here. Now if we go to the military screen here, you'll see the odds of winning in conflict against the enemy. So in North Korea, things are very even. There's a 50% chance of us winning or losing uh, at war. Both sides have equal firepower. So firepower is based on your military technology, which we have a level one technology on air, land, and sea. So does the US. Everybody starts out the same. That's what this one, two, uh, that's what this one and one represents. But then also based on the terrain you're fighting in, uh, the importance of each item is, is different based on different parts of the globe. So, for example, China, uh, air power and ground power are far more important than sea power, which is represented here. So, you get a multiplier effect in China for air and ground, and, uh, and as well as sea, but they're different in each country. So, Japan, for example, sea power gives you a multiplier of five, land power one, air power one. South Korea, it's one, one, and two. Sea power is important. In South Korea, in North Korea, it's more land focused, so it's a 1 2 1. And that affects uh, your total firepower score and your ability to win the conflict. So, for example, here, the, the multiplier, everybody has the same firepower, so it doesn't really matter right now. But you get a multiplier of 1 times your uh, level of research, so you're at, at tier 1 of each of these sections. So, if we go back to the military, for example, you'll see here we've got level 1 air, level 1 ground, and level 1 sea all researched. So you get a one times two, a one times one, or a one times one. That's how you get your firepower. Uh, and right now, because the game just started, the Korean War is a very even conflict. Hopefully that made sense. It was a little bit kludgy. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started again here. And you'll see that the uh, time just kind of slowly progresses. We can only support a parade or support a riot once per three months. Um, you can see the government and the revolutionaries are requesting military assistance from the Soviet Union. So in the south, uh, if we switch back over here, we can see we are losing casualties. We lost one of our units here uh, to enemy uh, action. Uh, we could support another riot, given it's been three months now. You can see we're already into May, and the enemy is increasing their spy capacity as well. Actually, here, let's go ahead and uh, pause this. We just got to notice that uh, Greece has a strong Communist Party contingent in 1950 here uh, you can see we've got about 45 influence over um over the government in greece uh, but they've got the current government does have support of the people we don't have any spies greece is a neutral country here that's why they've got these little gray military icons so there's sort of revolutionaries is my understanding of it uh that are neutral uh in greece we could add a spy and, and uh, add a spy network. Uh, we could also add some military support as well. You can see Soviet troops are entering Greece to support the local government. Seems a little bit silly. That wouldn't just happen uh, in in the um, in in the war or in, in the Cold War, but 
I suppose it is what it is. And if we go back to our budget after kind of making some of these changes, you'll see here, well, we don't have a revenue factor yet, but we're spending some of our, you know, $2,500 that you start out with. Um, if you drop below $2,000 in your budget, you get a crisis of the elites, which basically wipes out all of your spending everywhere and requires you to start over, which is a big deal considering you can only assign three, uh, you know, political points to increase spending in any one sector. So keep that in mind. Um, but if we go back to Europe here, well, let's drop this. If we go back to Europe, we'll see there's different countries, Italy, Yugoslavia, Austria, they're all neutral. Uh, they all have differing levels of support within their government. Um, really the only allied countries for the U.S. right now are West Germany, France, and the U.K. within Europe. So you can kind of slowly start to work on um, your various, uh, you know, the various governments that are either for you or, or against you. Um, you can see Finland, we only have 15 influence, but they're, you know, and in uh, Yugoslavia we've got 65 influence. So we could actually use a diplomat to increase influence as well. Um, and you can see here, for example, in Yugoslavia, we just increased our influence to 66 uh, by adding a diplomat. It reduced one of our diplomats down here. Now, I do think I need to spend a little bit of money on building more diplomats. Right now we're not building any new diplomats. We'll have to do that at the start of the new year once we have additional funds again. So we'll go ahead and unpause the game and we'll go back to uh, North, North Korea and we'll see how the conflict is evolving here. You can see here we're losing casualties. I don't see the enemy losing casualties, which is interesting, but you get this little notice that American troops are entering, so it sounds like they're just going to keep pouring troops into South Korea uh, as, as much as necessary. Uh, meanwhile, in uh, North Korea, they've also, they now outnumber us as well. So we need to keep our military support in North Korea up in order to prop this government up. Because if this goes down to zero, and there's a war going on like this, uh, we could actually see our uh, our troops overwhelmed and South Korea or North Korea be unified with the South. I don't know if there's a trigger to having uh, China enter the war on our side. I'm not quite sure, uh, but uh, certainly something we need to keep an eye on. Okay. So we're almost through the first year of war. This game goes pretty quick. You can see here we got three political points again now that we're through the year. Uh, you can see our budget went up a little bit. So if we go to the budget section, you can see we have 145 revenue after the first year, 60 expenditures. You can see the U.S. revenue actually went up substantially more than ours. Um, I'm not sure, it's not really clear if there's a, uh, a ability to increase your economic output. I haven't seen that yet, um, but, you know, just kind of thinking about that. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to go over to the diplomat screen. We're going to spend a dollar, one of our political points, on increasing our production of diplomats uh, to help increase our global political score. And um, we're going to go back to the space race here. You can see we're about halfway through... Uh, researching our ground facilities. I just noticed it's ground facilities, G-R-A-U-N-D, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, go back to the military realm. Uh, that's the problem is I don't have a ton of money to spend in the first place. You can see we don't have a huge difference between our revenue and our expenditures. So I don't know what I want to spend that money on. We'll finish our first space facility after this year. So maybe we leave our space facilities kind of as is. Um, I think we've got enough spies. We'll have some diplomatic production after this year. So I think maybe we start investing in, in some more military focused items. Um, so we'll go with the um, air and ground units to spend the remainder. We're kind of going militaristic in that we're investing heavily in our ground and now our air units as well for all of our political point needs. And then we'll go back to Korea, where you can see here, um, we're it looks like we're starting to get the edge in North Korea. You can see the American military forces are starting to decline, those blue bars. But in South Korea, we're also uh, starting to suffer as well. Um, so we're going with... So in North Korea, for example, we could have a support parade for that government, increase support. Uh, actually, let's pause real quick. Uh, we just got a little update. This little flag up here is for Angola. It says we can discredit American ambassador an in Angola, reduce the American influence in Angola here by uh, 10. It will also cost us $40. So if we do that, you can see here we just spent $40 of our budget on Angola, a one-time expenditure. It reduced the American influence in Angola by 10. Our own influence is at 40. So we've got an edge there. They're still neutral, but we definitely have an edge in terms of uh, the country of Angola. 
Uh, meanwhile, uh, Yugoslavia, you can see it looks like our influence is creeping up there, uh, perhaps due to our assigning of an ambassador. Uh, we're going to go ahead and assign, or we're going to go ahead and assign a diplomat to uh, Greece as well to try and win Greece over for our cause. Um, and we'll go ahead and I don't know if we support a parade or a riot. I'm not sure. I think the current government is actually democratic, so we probably want to support a riot. Granted, it's only going to do. Let's do this. We'll add two spy, one spy to Greece. Uh, you can see we've got five in in reserve. And then we'll go ahead and support a riot against the current government. It increases opposition in Greece. Um, meanwhile, in Yugoslavia, we'll kind of keep things as is. Bulgaria, Romania could use a little bit of support. So we'll go ahead and run a support parade for that government. And we'll do the same thing for Hungary. Each time we do that, uh, I believe it costs us costs us something. You can't do an infinite number of parades, but it's not quite clear to me what exactly. All right, guys. Well, that is going to do it for this video. This is sort of first video of my first playthrough. Um, I'm not sure I'm really able to give it a first impressions. It's almost just sort of a first look. It's still a little bit too early to, to have a verdict. It's an interesting looking game. It certainly um, is, piques my curiosity. I'm a big Cold War uh, enthusiast in terms of like what kind of things that interest me. Um, I think that the challenge is understanding how easy it is to figure things out about what works and what doesn't. I've definitely learned, and you'll see as the the series goes on how the space race works to do well there i think what's what's a bit mysterious to me is how you actually uh, successfully groom governments to be overthrown um a lot of this stuff is intuitive like increase opposition increase support increase the number of spies you have uh and also diplomacy uh but the biggest mystery to me is how influence works you know it, it doesn't seem to make a ton of sense to me um, but you know, it's, it's an interesting game. Nonetheless, I'll kind of provide more thoughts as we go through the rest of this. This was all taken from a live stream from last night. So over the next few days, I'll post the remaining parts of the series, uh, and, uh, kind of give you my thoughts throughout. I hope you guys enjoyed this first look at, uh, arms race, the cold war era, and, uh, join me for part two, which I think will come out tomorrow. Um, Ultimate General Civil War will continue, uh, but I'm also going to continue posting this as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts below. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.